want to read from 1 Corinthians 13. And in order to do a good job with that, we have to read the last verse of chapter 12. He says, Covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet are uh, shown to you a more excellent way or a far better way, something far better than having all the gifts of the Spirit. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, by the way, the word charity is a Latin word that simply means love. It didn't mean then what it means today. The caritas is just, it's a Latin word and simply means love. And so I'll read it that way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as sounding brass, or a clanging gong, one translation says, or a tinkling cymbal, or a clashing cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith, so that I can remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love doesn't envy, doesn't vaunt itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own. And by the way, if you want a definition of love, you find it right there. Whatever it is, whatever love is, it never seeks its own. Is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether it be prophecy, they shall fail. Whether it be tongues, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, that when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Boy, what a thought. And now by faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. My text is Jeremiah 46, 17. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, God says, just a noise, but a noise, nothing but a noise. That's my text. There's quite a number of Old Testament examples of people who are just noises, and New Testament as well, we're going to look at some of these. Remember when Elijah on Mount Carmel had that contest with the prophets? There were 850 prophets altogether, two different groups, and they prayed, and their way of praying, all day long, from morning till the evening, sacrifice. And then Elijah had a little fun. He said, hey, what's wrong, you guys? Cry louder. Cry louder, he told them, you know. Maybe your God is meditating. One trace translation says, maybe your God is sitting on the pot. <laughs> he's really giving him a hard time, you know. He, and maybe he's, not, maybe he's uh, in a journey, he said, or he might be pursuing something or someone, or maybe he's sleeping. You guys better shout louder, you know. They had a hard time. He had a sense of humor. And of course nothing happened. They jumped up and down, they cut themselves with knives, they were screeching and screaming all day long, and absolutely nothing happened until he prayed. His prayer isn't even three minutes long, you know. And then 
before God fell. Bring up the sacrifice, bring up the wood, bring up the, the stony altar, and lift up all the water in the trench. Remember, they put barrels of water in that stuff, you know. A kind of demonstration, but you know, 850 guys? Figure it up by hours. How many hours did they spend praying, you know? And what happened? Nothing. And sometimes that's the way we pray. We get nothing for our praying. We're not getting anywhere. Why is it? Let's look at it. Lamentations 2.17, it's, I don't know, it's a kind of isolated thought there that simply says, they made a noise in the house of God. So I presume they were there worshipping, and God said it was just a noise, you know, as far as he was concerned. It didn't mean anything. If my heart's not in it, God's not in it either. And so it has to come from my heart to his. In Hosea 7, 14, God said to Israel, You have not cried to me when you howled on your beds. So praying may be howling, just making a noise, you know. Well, this is what happened then. And there, Amos 8, 3, God said, your songs in the temple are howlings. Our singing may be just a noise too, you know. Just a noise. You know, you hear somebody with a beautiful voice and they sing so sweetly and great, you know. And somebody with very few singing just will sing and we fall asleep. We think, why don't they let that gal sing, you know? Why don't they do that? I was in a meeting one time and Doris Hodges sang. Doris Hodges, she's married now, she's a woman, I first think it's a woman or something, anyway, she's a bad little woman, she never had much of a voice. The problem with people are when she was through singing, as she was singing, God came in on the song, and everybody in the place knew it. And when I spoke afterwards, it was the easiest speaking I ever did, I'll tell you. I knew what God was doing. When I was through, I went to my, my, to my chair, and I knelt at my chair and just prayed. And when I was sat there, I got up and said, the concert room's over there. And there must have been 150 people just stamping it out the door to meet with God. It wasn't my sermon. It was this gal. So don't make the mistake of judging somebody who doesn't have a sweet voice and can't hit the high notes. We can't hit the low notes, you know. That's got nothing to do with that. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, God has perfected praise. When he keeps these things in my hollowings in the temple, God said, your songs. That's what he said. Well, in the 5.23, God says, take away the noise of your songs. Stop it. Cut it up. God hates it. The heart isn't in it, you know. It's not a performance. Preaching is not a performance. And singing is not a performance. They are ministries. And the Holy Ghost has got to be in them or else they don't do anything. We waste our time and God's time and people's time as well. In Malachi 2.13, God said, This have you done again. Covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with crying out, insomuch that what? Insomuch that he regards not the offering anymore, nor receives it with goodwill at your hand. So the question is, why, God? Why? And three times he said, because you guys are dealing treacherously with the wife of your youth. That's why. Now Jeremiah speaks about a woman treacherously departing from her husband. I mean, a woman may do that too. So God was not interested in their praying, their crying, their tears even at the altar, because they weren't right with their wives. So they were just a noise, you know, as far as God was concerned. Just a noise. In India one time, uh, three of us, we went to a Hindu temple. We wanted to get inside and have a look at things and see how the good things are. There's a couple of ugly, I mean really ugly, stone gods in there and 
people are kneeling all around and screeching and screaming to these things, you know. But to get into the temple, you have to walk through a thing was probably as long as from here to the back wall, kind of an arbor, you know, with branches and stuff on it to get in. And on, on the top of this thing, there were bells. Little bells about the side. A whole flock of them. And the lady came along with a baby. And so we saw she hit this bell, she hit the next bell, and then we found this was to waken their God. They might be sleeping, you know. But at the end, there was a big bell about this big, you know. And so she lifted this baby up. The idea was the baby should hit the bell. The kid didn't know that. So she takes the kid, why is the bell with the kid, you know? I mean, the God might be asleep. God might choose the light, you know. What nonsense. But that was today in India. Millions are still doing it. But sometimes we're doing it in evangelical churches too, in a slightly more refined and cultured and evangelical way. Well, in the New Testament, Matthew 6, Jesus said, we're well, not to use vain repetition like the heathen do. They think they're going to be heard for their much speaking. And I suppose for their loud speaking. In some countries, I've seen this in some countries too, where they have a water wheel and it's a prayer wheel. It's really time to prayer, the wheel turns, it answers the prayer for somebody or it has something to do with getting prayers answered. And sometimes they had the same kind of wheel just in the wind. And as the wind blown, it blew it then. But you know, sometimes what we're doing is no different. It's just a little more refined and cultured, you know. And God isn't listening. So. Down in Santiago, Chile. You know, in the Catholic Church, they worship the Virgin Mary, but they say... It's not real worship. It's the difference between patria and latria, and it's, it's I think it's latria, not patria, whatever that means. And uh, so, but I saw some people, so I got in my movie camera, got some movies. And there's a statue of the Virgin Mary, probably 15 feet high, about six feet off the ground, down by a sidewalk. And people were kneeling down there, and they had their arms stretched, and they were screaming at the tops of their voices, you know, to Mary. Don't tell me they don't worship Mary. They were acting as if she was their god. Again, big noise, nothing happening. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, and have no love. What am I? I'm a clanging gong. I'm a clashing cymbal. I'm just a noise. Hey, he's talking to Christians. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, I don't have the love of God in my soul. I'm just a noise. Remember we're told in Ephesians 4, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, clamor. You know, there's people that make a noise to be seen. Down in, I think it was Binghamton, New York, I had a crusade and preacher's daughter. She was, I mean, if there's 60 people in the room, you'd notice her first because she was always talking and laughing and punching people in the ribs and having a great time. And God got a hold of her. I won't forget her testimony. She said, I was the nicest person in the place because I wanted to be noticed. And God took care of that. So we don't want to be noticed. We want Christ to be noticed. I don't know how often, I'm sure most preachers do this, at least if we love God, we do and we, we pray, dear God, don't let the people see me. Don't let them remember me. Let them see Jesus. John 12 says, Sir, we would see Jesus. And that's why we're here, is to represent Him, and not just make a noise. Well, we read in 1 John 4, 8 and 16, God is love. God is love. I remember a couple of times they were having some, I think it was who parents were coming to say they weren't Christians. And so you know what they were doing because they wanted to impress the parents with how wonderful it was to be a Christian. They practiced smiling all the time. In front of the mirror and all this kind of garbage, you know. So they'd be smiling when they looked at it. It's crazy, you know, but they thought it was the way to do it, you know. And so sometimes we put on a face, you know, that doesn't agree with the heart, and 
the heart starts complaining because the face isn't right, you know. And I can understand that as well. Anyway, God is love. He doesn't have to try to love. He doesn't have to practice, you know. God is love. Sometimes we have to practice. It shouldn't be that way. We'll talk about that a little later on. Second Peter 1 4 says, But we have become partakers of God's divine nature. It doesn't say to what extent, but to some extent, we have become partakers of God's divine nature, which means that we ought to be, from the day we were converted, a loving person. A person in whom God can pour his spirit and reveal himself. We're here, you know, for that reason. God should save us and take us all home to heaven. That isn't what happens in his plan. He leaves us here so we can be a channel for his love and for his grace and power. God is love we're partakers. Let me give you an illustration of that. In China, when Mao was in power, there was a thing called the Red Gods, a group of people, they were young people, they were given permission from the government to go to China and murder or, or beat up anybody who was religious or wealthy or, or intellectual. And they murdered thousands of people all over China. It finally got a little bit out of hand, so the government stopped it. In the meantime, tens of thousands had died. A bunch of these red guards broke into a house, a Christian home one night, and clubbed everybody to death. The mother recovered. She, she recovered, but all her family did. They were dead. Well, one of the things found this report, she found that the leader of the gang that murdered her family was living just two or three blocks from where she was. How did she handle that? How did she handle it? She started praying for this guy. And then she heard that he had a son that was sick, and he didn't have any money, he couldn't get a doctor to go to the hospital, and so she prayed about the Lord told her what to do, and she went down to this man. He did not, of course, recognize her. She said nothing about what had happened that night. And she said, I heard your son wasn't well, and you have any money. She said, I'd like to, to nurse your son back to hell. Really? He, was so, he didn't have a wife, and he was so overjoyed and couldn't understand it, but she took this child home and nursed him back to hell. And she took him back to her, his father three weeks later, and then she told him who she was. And he looked at her. <laughs> he fell on the floor, began to weep, and he wept and wept and wept. And she led him to Christ. She led him to Christ. Calvary love. We can't do that naturally. Supernaturally, yes, by the grace of God. But the potential is there. Because the Spirit of God lives within us. Partakers of the divine nature, the Word of God says. Now it says in 1 Thessalonians 4 9 that we are taught of God to love one another. How are we taught? How do you think we're taught? We're taught in three ways by precept, command, and example. Precept, 1 John chapter 4, there's a verse that says, Beloved, the word beloved means divinely loved one. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. Listen carefully. He that loves not knows not God. There are twelve places in First John where love is made the acid test of reality in the Christian life. He that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. Twelve places like that. This is the acid test. He that loves not knows not God. Then there must be a lot of people in our evangelical churches that don't know God. Taylor said probably not more than 20% really know God. I don't know where he got the statistics from. I know where I got them. He that loves not knows not God. Precept. Command, this is his commandment, 
that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ okay we evangelicals we, we've all managed that what about the rest of the verse and love one another as the name is commanded it goes together you know you can't separate the two or we've managed to separate these two in evangelical churches that is we believe on Jesus but we don't love one another have I really believed on Jesus if I can't love my brother and sister in Christ well people say well yeah that's fine but then you don't get it when you get converted it takes maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years before you get into this love thing is that what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1 he says, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with pure heart fervently, being born again. If you're born again, you should be loving your brother and sister with a pure heart fervently. And then you treat the old women as mothers, the young women as sisters, it says, with all purity. Okay, precept, command, example, 1 John 3, 16. Hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. It's not how it is. That's how it ought to be. That's what he was saying. Pharaoh was just a noise Prayer can be a noise, sin can be a noise, a, a, a meeting in a temple. Well, we don't say alone. God said he hated and despised their assemblies. That's putting it pretty strongly. For what purpose, he said? For what purpose is the multitude of your transgressions? They dedicated the temple. How many animals did they kill? Was it 140,000? Something like that. They had to have a special place. They didn't have the altar. wasn't big enough to handle it. I mean, one was done because it was speaking of the coming of Christ. One, uh, one such would have been plenty. And because there was that many, I suppose they thought they'd get more favor with God by killing more, more animals, you know. But God said, to what purpose is all of this, you know? What are you doing? What are you at? Why are you doing these things? Where is your heart? Well, precept, command, example. Call of God. First Thessalonians 3, 12 goes like this. The Lord make you to increase and abound in love, one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you to the end. That is, for what purpose? To the end. Listen carefully. That he may establish your hearts unvulnerable in holiness before God is my Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. You are not ready, nor am I. You are not ready for the coming of Christ if you're not filled with the love of God. That's what he's saying. That's what it's all about. So when Christ comes and he can meet the church, walking in love, abounding with thanksgiving. It's not how it is. It's how it ought to be. All right, then, to go back to 1 Corinthians 16, 14, he says, Let all your things be done with love. Let all your things be done with love. Everything you do, do it in a loving way. Sometimes we do things and we grind our teeth. We don't like doing it, but we have to. And so we're bitter in our soul. And then we wonder why it is. We get nowhere. We never want a soul to Christ. We never do anything. We never see any blessing. A fellow, he was a high school teacher for many years, and then one of the university professor. For 25 years, he told me, he never won a soul to Christ. Although he was known to be a Christian and evangelical professor, a man, no student ever came to talk to him about God. For 25 years, this went on, and nothing ever happened. He 
one day he had a meeting with God. I just happened to be there listening. How he prayed, all people. He was praying for God to kill him. He meant spiritually, you know. Kill me, God. He said, Oh, God, kill me now. Dead, he said. I'm in bed, God. Kill me. Dead. Now. And there was silence. And I heard him say, Oh, what peace. He was flooded with the Spirit of God. And the very next Sunday, he spoke in the Baptist church. And halfway through his sermon, a lady got and said, Sir, can you stop preaching? I have to get to the altar to meet with my God. And I gave an invitation. And the altar was crowded with people. He phoned me that night. I was in the Maritimes at the time. He said, Bill, more happened than one man than has happened in 25 years. What happened? He'd been flooded with the love of God. That's all. And Spurgeon said, the fullness of the love of Christ comes when you die to yourself. Don't forget it. It's costly. It's costly. Well, you know the guy, I think his name is Schultz, who does a Snoopy comic. Anybody read Snoopy comics? You know, he's not a Christian. He says he is, but he's not, he doesn't really believe he's being born again. But there's an old song that a stop clock is right twice a day, right? So he's not always wrong, you know. Are you still thinking of him too? <laughs> About the stop clock? And one day he did, he did a cartoon, which I saw, and here's Snoopy the dog, he's wet, he's cold, he's lonesome, he's shaking, the snow is falling, he's all by himself shaking, and the kids all come, and they stick their hands on his head, and he prayed for God to bless him and walked away. And the Bible speaks about that. Maybe he got it. I think he got it from the Bible. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of one daily food, and one of you send him, be warmed and filled, but you give him nothing. What is a prophet? What's that all about? Yeah. And so sometimes we're like this. Somebody, sometimes the people we pray for, what they really need is a $20 bill, you know, or something else. Okay. Snoopy. We'll forget him. First John 3.18 says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And that's maybe a takeoff from Ezekiel 33.31 which says, With their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. So we can talk it I heard about a couple, and he defended her, and she froze up, and he couldn't make her talk, and so on. So one day he invited her to go for a walk, and she went with him. And, and so they were walking along, you know, and she wouldn't talk. He tried, she wouldn't say a word, you know. So when a bird sang, she stopped to listen. And he said to her, Do you know what I think that bird is singing? She said, No. He said, I love you, I love you, I love you. And she said, no, I think it's saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, yeah, the human element, terrible. Anyway. I mentioned before, I think that in first time there's 40 references to love. There's only one reference to love in the whole of the Quran, just one. But there's almost 600 references to hell and eternal punishment. These people are living in terrible fear of hell. You know. And they're saying if you die a suicide death and kill others, it's a moral thing. That's why it's almost only men that do it, occasionally men and women. I don't know what they promise a woman. You know what they promise a man is? He's going to wind up with a beautiful castle on the shores of a beautiful river, all kinds of wine to eat, to drink, and 40 virgins. 
to take care of the sexual needs, and God will give you such sexual ability you can take care of 40 virgins. That's what the guys are dying for. It's a real thing. Absolutely. Uh, what's the word? Somebody got a word for it? No martyr has a turn around for that in him. I feel so so these people die and find themselves not on the bank of a beautiful river. They find themselves in hell. No murder has eternal life abiding in him. They don't know that. Somehow we need to tell them that so they understand. Interesting story from India. A Christian worker walking down the street, he saw a blind man sitting there, and he paid me just walk by him. He had to walk by him a couple of times, and the Lord said, I want you to you know, just sit down and talk to him. So he sat down with the guy and introduced himself and started preaching the gospel. The guy turned a spit in his face. How would you handle that? He got up and got out of there. Man, whew, he felt terribly, you know, really mad. The Lord said, go back again. He argued, oh, I can't go back again. I mean, he'll do the same thing. Man, I'm not just back. So he went back and he got spit on again. I think he went back four times and each time he got spit in the face. But the fifth time, the guy got saved. Now he's blind. He immediately went back to the village from whence he came. He was in the city because he was begging. He went back to the village from whence he came and he led about 50 people to Christ. Now this Christian worker didn't know what God was going to do with this blind fellow. And I couldn't understand why it was so important he get back there and talk to him. But God had a larger plan. He always had a larger plan. It's a lot larger than ours is. I wanted to find out. You know, Bach sang in India. I never met him. But he wrote a book. It's called The Return of God's Glory. He's not a great writer. I mean, he's poorly written. I don't think you can get the book here in Canada. I've got a copy of something in my library. I'm so glad I read it. You know, we used to call him the Billy Graham of India. And Western missionaries used him and thousands of people found Christ their Savior. And finally, Bach Singh came to the conclusion this was not the way to reach India's millions. So he broke with the missionaries amicably. Well, some of them really were ha angry because he did this, but he went on his own, and here's what he did. He got together half a dozen godly people and said, Look, we're going to find what God really wants us to do. We're not going to do anything until we find what He wants us to do. And they fasted and prayed for several days, and God made it clear that to go as a team to a certain marketplace and evangelize. So they went to this marketplace and evangelize, and nothing happened. So they went back to fasting and praying again, which is the right thing to do. And God showed me when you got to the marketplace, you don't wait for my guidance, you just did your own thing. So we went back to the marketplace, they had a prayer meeting, and God led them, the team began to move, and souls accepted Christ. And here's what he said. When we started doing God's work in God's way, the glory of God returned. He said, we have had many who were ever been as powerful as any kind of meeting that Charles C. ever had. The power of God. You know, he may be dead now. Last I heard, I think he was 83 or something. But at an annual conference, 20,000 people showing up. He probably had, it started about 700 churches in India, and suddenly running in thousands of people. Back soon. Do you know where he found Christ? In Winnipeg, Canada. Back soon. John Song, Song Song, Song was a great evangelist in China. Guess where he found Christ? He found Christ in the United States of America. Sing, sing. That's the message over that. Anyway. Well, when Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica, he said, among other things, your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all towards each other abounds. And he was so pleased to know this was happening in the church at Thessalonica. They were a godly church at that time. There's still a church in Thessalonica. 
as smart as it was then, although a friend of mine was there, he said the singing seemed to be great, and, and he said at one point he, he couldn't go along with it, he just sat there and wept, you know. So maybe there's some good things happening at something like uh, yet, and I don't really know. Okay. You know, sometimes, let me give you an illustration. It's wintertime, and you hear somebody, they're stuck in a snow bank in front of your house. It's a neighbor, you know. So you all go to the window and you look up and watch him, and then the guy looks at his watch and says, I wonder how long it'll take him to get out of the snow bank. See? 18 minutes. It took him 18 minutes. To get out. His wife was out there pushing, the kids were out there pushing. And he sees you standing at the window. See? Well, next spring, you're having a uh, little daily vacation. Bump. He's got a bunch of kids. So you go over and Jesus, don't put on your best smile and, and ask him to think about sending his kids to your Sunday school. And he answers gruffly, and you don't understand why. But he saw you looking out the window. He doesn't know it took 18 minutes. You know that. But you should have been out there helping him. You know. Remember once in a bank, my wife and I found ten dollars lying on the floor so we picked it up and said to the teller it's not ours whose is it she said i don't have any you keep it no 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 somebody's lost this you know so we gave it to the teller and said let us know if somebody comes in looking for it and so she finally said oh there's an old man here and he he was so concerned because he had so little money he was so glad he got his ten dollars back you know well, we could have stuck it in our pocket and gone home and hey Thank you, Lord, for the ten bucks. But that's not really what I wanted, you know. See. Love seeks not her own. Under any circumstances, we'll always be thinking of the other person and how to be a blessing to this person. How can I help them? How can I encourage them? What can I do for them? And some of you will be saying, that's not practical. There's a lot of things that are practical, that are good, and right. We say they're not practical because we're not yet dead to self. We're not at that point where we're willing to die to self and live to the glory, to the glory of God. Spurgeon said, Praising God with all of my might, in the sea of God's delight, self is drawn, and I am free. Christ in love will lead me. And that's it. That's what it's all about. You know, what's your, uh, if they have room on the heaven, I'm going to hear them preach. Maybe spread and a few others beside. I wouldn't mind hearing Billy Sunday either. Well, I saw him on tape one time. But Whitfield, he was so filled with the love of God that many times he was overcome in his sermon. And he'd stand there, or he said sometimes he'd walk around in a little circle, stamping his feet and wringing his hands. He cried, God, what can I do for these people? There's so many of them. How can I help them? God, give me power to preach the gospel. And this went on and on, you know. And Wesley and he was our many and what he was Calvinist, and we had some little problem there. But Wesley preached the memorial sermon for Whitfield, and somebody asked him, Do you really think he'll be in heaven as a Calvinist, you know? And he said, Wesley said, Listen, he'll be so close to the throne that you don't want to see him. So he had it right, you know. Yeah. But it must have been something to, to hear him. When Whitfield hit a town, word would spread like that. We didn't have telephones in those days. I wish we didn't have them today. But they were, you know, but word would travel like wildfire. And if he was to preach in some open area an hour later, there'd be 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 people. Everything closed. All the stores closed. The school had me. People came running from the fields. Whitfield's here. And he preached one sermon and they'd gone on his horse to another place. He might preach six times in a day. When he was not feeling well, a doctor told him that he shouldn't preach more than four times a day. And he said, But preaching is my medicine. I get better when I preach. 
But after he left, they said for months there would be waves of spiritual power moving out in all directions from that one sermon. In the last two years of his life, they hired a young man to stay with Spurgeon day and, or with the with your day and night because they knew he was very close to death. He died at the age of 56. He had TB. He spit blood the last few years of his life. After he died, the young man said, he said, it's all true. He's exactly what you've heard at night. He was up many nights weeping for souls all night. He said, I'm talking to Jesus all the time. It's all true what I've been heard. And so, 56, I guess God took me on to the kingdom of love. Wouldn't it be nice to, again, if they had heard one, if you could see what feel when you hit heaven, you know. Anyway, forgive my flights of imagination. Only once in the Bible do you find this phrase, the love of the Spirit. I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me, and you pray to God for me. Romans 15, 30. The only place we read about the love of the Spirit. When in Colossians 1 you have this phrase, it only occurs once in the Bible, your love in the Spirit. Your love in the Spirit. Then in Romans 5 we read this. It says, the love of God is shed about or poured forth in your hearts by the Holy Ghost who has given them to us. So the work of the Spirit in our heart is to pour out the love of God in our souls. That's what he's doing. That's what he's trying to do. Many times he can't do it because we're not really interested. We've got our own program to work with. We're at any time to give to anybody else. If you've got that kind of a job, you better get a better job. We have no time. That's possible, too, you know. It's not a money thing, you know. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Jesus taught us that we've forgotten that. You know the Samaritan dream thing? It doesn't mean a thing to God. It's, it's not a dream, it's a nightmare. You don't have to have a house with, you know, four bedrooms and three bathrooms. I know a guy, matter of fact, I went to Christ many years ago. He was a mushroom farmer here in Transcoming. He moved down to the States and he built himself a shack. 12,000 people square feet. He said there were 12 bathrooms and he said, I don't want to go to the bathroom. I don't want to go longer than about six feet, you know. So, he soon built a house on the same property and he kind of sort of sneered almost, he said. <laughs> 2,000 square feet. A little shack, you know. He's dead now. I'm not his judge, but I tell you something, he was a great witness for God, no matter what. He was always... Women couldn't stand him. He didn't know how to talk to a gal, you know. He didn't have a clue. The reason being, when he left home, Simco, Ontario, he was 14 years of age, running for his life. His dad was chasing him with a pitchfork. He said, if the old man had a cotton, he'd have been dead. The hand was never saw that again. That's how he started. So he didn't know how to talk to people, but none would listen to him and led people to Christ. He had a wrong attitude towards money, but he started with zero, with nothing. And he's like, he didn't quite get over that, as he might have, and should have. Anyway, the Holy Spirit of people, he's trying to fill us with the love of God. Has he succeeded in your life? How's it going? Do you love one another with a pure heart, fervently? Have fervent love among yourself, for love shall cover the much of sins. Do we have that? We can't operate as a dad or a mom or as a child with parents unless we're touched by the love of God. I never forget a conference one time. Leonard Ravenhill was one of the speakers, and Leonard Ravenhill was about my age then. He's dead now. Pardon me, he's alive now in heaven. And um, he'd preach for two hours, you know. And my wife was sitting down here, and he'd be telling the story, and he'd say, Honey, I forget to ask the story. How does it go? And she'd tell him, Oh, that's the story. He'd finish the story, you know. No problem. But, but a great time, but he, he had to go. And he had another Southern Baptist, I forget the guy's name, tremendous preacher. He's gone now, too. 
and he had to leave early, and Rafa and Shapiro had to leave early, and I left alone on Friday, you know, over Sunday. And uh, I've been doing some messages on the love of God, and uh, we had a, a sharing time Friday night. It went on for 40 minutes at least. It was just incredible what was happening. And uh, one of the guys said, you know, the Lord got a hold of my heart, this love thing, and he said, I began looking at people's new eyes. He said, as I was going home yesterday, I saw a, car, a fellow at a McDonald's, and he'd gone in and left his car lights on. So I stopped, pulled in, and went over, his door was open, so I turned his lights off. He said, just a little thing, you know, but he said, I would never have done that before. That's his problem. But the battles are dead, you know. And then he was driving along, and he saw two ladies sitting in a car, and they were talking, looking. On the phone, and the lady in the next thing, she's talking, and she mentions the very name, the thing was mentioned, so we talked to him, and she came out, and she said, Oh, we're looking for them, where are they? So he took him down. And they thanked him, and he said, I felt real good, you know? Then he's driving along, he saw two people, two ladies, and they were in a, a motorized unit, and uh, they were talking there, and he went on to see if he would help them. The guy said, my mom, she, she's, uh, she's got diabetes, and she looks, she's going to go into a coma, and I don't know what to do. He said, lady, I'll get help right away. He went back to the telephones, I've got my mom, my or whatever, you know? And, and so, when he was telling the story, you know, he said, I felt so good. I just felt so good. And he said, you know, that last lady I talked to, I bet she was 80. And he didn't know she was in the meeting. And she got up and said, no, dear, I'm 85. <laughs> and the place just exploded, you know, see. We don't have much of that in Christian circles and we want to do it. And it doesn't happen that way. It's all show and do people looking at the watches. He preached 35 minutes. Boy, oh, boy, I'm going to talk to the deacons about this, you know. That's how it was, right? And then a fellow got saved, and he was the poorest of the poor. And the fellow could read and write, and he came one day and said, Well, what's this tithing thing in the Bible? Oh, he said, it's, uh, it's you give God one in ten if you can afford it. No, it says right here, the tithe is the Lord's. It doesn't say if you can afford it. So I don't know what to do. So he said, well, yeah, yeah. So the guy says, one egg in ten is God's? No, well, if you want to. You know. And he started tithing. He became the best off guy in the whole congregation. Five of the men had a meeting with this guy and asked what the secret was. He said, it's called tithing. They said, what's that? And he explained it. And they all began tithing. You know what happened? They, the church was subsisting in money from the states. Not very long after they got tithing, they were supporting one preacher and helping support a preacher in another congregation. And now finally, the tears, he said, Bill, you know, and he said, I failed those people. I didn't read it right. I wasn't thinking right. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto you bills and forth. The same measure that you meet or give, it shall be measured to you again. Okay. If I don't have it, how do I get it? I think you know. People have to die to ourselves. Come to an end of myself and my strivings, my wants and all that. How do I do that? You have to meet with Christ at the cross. You can't crucify yourself. Galatians 5.24 says, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh for the passions and loves. But if you could crucify yourself physically, you'd always have one hand left. Not, not crucified. You can't really do that. But you can be willing for God to do it. It's a case people we have to get desperate, get alone with God, and stay with God. You know, some people don't like Jack Hiles. I think there's all the cloud there at times, but nobody ever argued against the soul winning he did. I was in Chicago, which is quite a ways from Hammond where he was. I stayed in this house. One day, a guy from Jack House Church was ringing my doorbell, trying to win people to Christ in Chicago. I think he had 150 buses picking up people. But you know, at one point, the little Baptist church in Texas, and nothing ever happened. 40, 50 members, nobody ever got saved. 
And then his father, who was an alcoholic, died. And this brought Jack Hiles to a climax. When the funeral was over and all the relatives had gone home, he went up to his daddy's grave, which was in a seminary, a cemetery, which was uh, secluded. And he threw himself over his father's grave, and this was his prayer. Dear God, I won't eat and I won't drink until you give me power to preach the gospel. And he said, I'll die if I have to, but I won't move until you give me power to preach the gospel. All he ever said was this, on the third day, or after three days, God touched me. He went back to this church and preached, and 18 people were converted the first time he preached. That church went from 40 and 50 members up to 2,000 members in about six years. Then went up to Hannah in the air. And he said, whenever I feel the power isn't there, I do it again. I get fasting. I get other people fasting. We fast and pray till the power returns. Then he said exactly the same thing. When the glory seems to be departed, you stop, pray, fast for some days, call on God, it'll come back. You know. The love of God is poured out in my heart, in our hearts, by the Holy Ghost, who is given unto us. So the Spirit of God has to do it. We have to get God's power to crucify self, to die to self. So it can live unto God. Except a kernel of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Much fruit. Much fruit. Let's pray.